Top tips and reminders for OCR A, A level chemistry, paper 3, 2019. So I'm basing these on the predictions that I've already made for the paper. So that's them there. So I've basically got a slide or two on each of these going through the essentials of each of the topics. And like I always say, please bear in mind these are my educated guesses. Obviously, I don't know what is on the exam, I could be wrong. So don't just base your revision on this. So we'll start with structure and bonding. Metals have a giant metallic lattice. That's a lattice of metal cations, positive ions, and delocalized electrons. Ionic substances, that's metal and non-metal, have a giant ionic lattice, that's a lattice of oppositely charged ions. Covalent substances, that's non-metals only, most of them form simple covalent lattices in the solid state, and that's a lattice of simple molecules with weak intermolecular forces between them, but strong covalent bonds between the atoms, remember. Some covalent substances, and it's a very small list, so boron, Carbon, so you've got your graphite, diamond, and graphene. Silicon and silicon dioxide form giant covalent lattices. That's a lattice of covalently bonded atoms, or SiO2s in the case of silicon dioxide. So we've just got this summary table now for melting point and electrical conductivity. So we'll start with melting point. Metallic high, ionic high, simple covalent low, giant covalent high. And obviously you would need to talk about the amount of energy required to overcome the attractions going on between these particles here. Electrical conductivity in the solid state, so metals, yes, they can conduct. Ionic, no. Simple covalent, no. Giant covalent, no, unless it's graphite or graphene. So moving on to liquid or aqueous, yes, for metallic, obviously that's just liquid. Ionic, Yes, simple covalent no, and giant covalent no, again unless it's graphite or graphene. So for the electrical conductivity explanation it's all down to does it have freely moving charged particles. So moving on to intermolecular forces now. So they exist between molecules of simple covalent substances. There's three types, induced dipole, dipole or London forces permanent dipole, dipole, or hydrogen bonds. So we'll take each one in turn. Induced dipole, dipole, or London exists between all molecules, and that's because these forces are caused by electrons. All molecules have electrons, and they get stronger as the number of electrons in a molecule increases. And it's the only intermolecular force between non-polar molecules. Permanent dipole, dipole now, exist between molecules with a permanent dipole, in other words, polar molecules. Hydrogen bonds just a special type of permanent dipole-dipole force, and they exist between polar molecules that have a hydrogen that's directly bonded to a fluorine, an oxygen, or a nitrogen. So in terms of relative strength order, so that the general trend is hydrogen bonds the strongest, then permanent dipole-dipole, and then induce dipole, dipole, or London. But just remember, if a non-polar molecule has a lot of electrons, its intermolecular forces can actually become stronger than the other two. So moving on to shapes and bond angles now. So the first thing you would do is count the number of electron regions. That's the safest term to use, rather than electron pairs, just in case there's double bonds in there. So number of electron regions, including lone pairs, around the valence shell of the central atom. And remember that multiple bonds count as one region. Then I would say how many bonding regions and how many lone pairs you've got. Then say will the repulsion be equal or not, and if not, why not? And remember the order of repulsion. Lone pair to lone pair is greater than lone pair to bonding pair, which is greater than bonding pair to bonding pair. And as a rule of thumb, every lone pair reduces the bond angle by two and a half degrees. And then you would just come up with your associated shape and angle. So I've got a table of all of that. 
So there's the table with some examples in. You might want to take a screenshot of that. So moving on to storage cells or batteries, we would refer to them as. So they contain two half cells with different electrode potentials. The most positive electrode potential gains the electrons and is the positive terminal of the battery. The least positive one loses the electrons and that's the negative terminal. The voltage for the cell or the E cell is the most positive minus the least positive. There are different types of storage cells, so primary ones are non-rechargeable and secondary ones are rechargeable. They both produce a voltage as they discharge, so that's a fancy term for operate, so when the battery operates it's discharging. So with a primary cell, the cell reaction can't be reversed, so you can only use that once. As soon as the chemicals get used up, it goes flat. Secondaries, the cell reaction can be reversed, so you can use them again. So as soon as the chemicals get used up, it goes flat, just like your phone battery. But then you'd plug it into an external electricity supply, so your charger, and that forces the natural cell reaction in the opposite direction, and it makes the reactants back. So fuel cells now. Fuel cells require a constant supply of fuel and oxygen going into the cell. The fuel always gives up its electrons, so that's going to have the least positive electrode potential. And that happens at the negative anode, and oxidation is going to take place there. So I've got that word oxana to remember that oxidation takes place at the anode. Oxygen always gains electrons, that's the most positive electrode potential. And that happens at the positive cathode, so red cat. Reduction takes place at the cathode. Liquid fuels such as methanol are much easier to store than pressurised gases such as hydrogen. The Arrhenius equation now, so that's on the data sheet, you don't need to remember that. So we'll just run through the terms. K stands for the rate constant. A is the pre-exponential or frequency factor, and that's constant for a particular reaction. EA is the activation energy, but remember that's in joules per mole, not kilojoules per mole. R is the gas constant, so 8.314 joules per mole per kelvin. It's on the data sheet, so you don't have to remember that. T obviously stands for temperature, and that's in kelvin. And the units of EA over RT cancel, so the units of K are the units of A. Arrhenius plots now, so this is when you have to draw a graph and you use the natural log form of the equation, which I've got there, and again that's on the data sheet. So the easiest thing to do with this is to sort of view it as um, a y equals mx plus c equation, so you can see what I've done there. So now you can see that plotting lin k against 1 over t is going to give you a, a downward straight line because the gradient is going to be negative. So it's minus E A over R times 1 over T. So the gradient, I've just said, is minus E A over R. The activation energy, remember that's in joules, is going to be equal to the gradient multiplied by R, the gas constant. And E A is always positive. You should never get a negative value for your activation energy. The y-intercept is equal to lin A. So A would be E to the y-intercept. And sometimes your x-axis doesn't start at zero. You can't use the y-intercept. So what you do in that case is you pick any point on the line and substitute in the lin k value, the 1 over t value, and the gradient that you've probably just calculated, and then solve for lin A. So right in half equations, I've got two slides for this. The first one's in acid conditions, which I think is the easiest one. And I would always do it this way, unless the specified has to be in alkaline conditions. So the first thing you do is balance the atoms using H plus ions and water. And just beware, something like this, Cr2O72 minus turning into Cr3 plus, 
don't forget you're going to need to double that chromium 3 plus before you do anything else. So once you've balanced the atoms using the H plus and the water, you balance for charge using electrons, and you've got to have the same overall charge left and right. And then finally, just do a final check that the equation balances for atoms and charge. So if you're asked to do one in alkaline conditions, a slightly different order to it. So the first thing you do is calculate the change in oxidation number for the element that's been oxidized or reduced. And the change in oxidation number is equal to the number of electrons you need in your half equation. So for example, using that dichromate to Cr3+, the oxidation number changes 3 because it's gone from plus 6 here to plus 3 there. But because there's two of them involved, then we need six electrons altogether. So the electrons go in first. You then balance the charge using OH minus ions, and then you finish off balancing the atoms with water. And then obviously do a quick check that it balances for atoms and charge. So qualitative analysis now, I've got a slide with the cations on. So we'll just run through the test, the observation and the equation for these positively charged ions. So for the ammonium ion, you add sodium hydroxide, aqueous, warm gently and test the gas with damp red litmus. The litmus paper should go blue if there's ammonium ions present. And there's the equation there. So it's the ammonia gas that's produced that's causing the litmus to change from red to blue. Copper 2 plus ions, you add sodium hydroxide aqueous until in excess. You get a pale blue precipitate which is insoluble in excess NaOH. And there's the equation for that one. Manganese 2, exactly the same as before. This time you get a light brown precipitate or a sort of beige precipitate you could say. And again, that's insoluble in excess NaOH. There's the equation. Iron 2, same again, but this time a green precipitate, insoluble in excess. There's the equation. Same for iron 3, but this time it's an orange-brown precipitate, insoluble in excess again. There's the equation. And finally, thankfully, it's the chromium 3 ion, so you add NaOH until excess. Green precipitate, but this one is soluble in excess NaOH, and you get a green solution. So there's two equations to remember for that one. There's the precipitation reaction, and there's the excess sodium hydroxide equation. So for anions now, so we've got three anions we need another test for, carbonate, sulfate, and halide. So the test for carbonate, add dilute nitric acid, test the gas by bubbling through lime water. So obviously you would see bubbles or effervescence from the gas produced. And because it's CO2, it'll turn the lime water cloudy. And there's the equation. Sulfate, you need to add a source of barium 2 plus ions. So the best one to use is barium nitrate because that doesn't have any other ions that will contaminate the test. And you get a white precipitate. And there's the equation. So for halide, we've obviously got three things we can test for, chloride, bromide, and iodide. So we'll look at each one. So each test has the same sort of procedure. Add aqueous silver nitrate, and then follow up by adding aqueous ammonia. So the observations, you get a white precipitate of silver chloride, if it's a chloride, which is soluble in dilute aqueous ammonia. You get a cream precipitate if it was bromide ions, so that's silver bromide precipitate and that's soluble in concentrated aqueous ammonia and if you had iodide ions you get a yellow precipitate of silver iodide and that's insoluble in conch ammonia so the equations very similar that's them there and sticking with the anions you need to know the correct order of the tests so if you're testing an unknown substance, you should carry them out in the order of carbonate first, then sulfate, then halide. So I use the word cash to remember that order. And the reason for that is you get false positive results if you do them in the wrong order. So if you added barium ions to carbonate ions, so if you did the sulfate test first, but you've got carbonate ions present, 
you're going to get a white precipitate of barium carbonate. But because you don't know that the carbonate ions, you're going to think you've got a sulfate. And the equation for that looks like that. If you added um, silver ions to carbonate ions, so if you've carried out a halide test on a carbonate, but you don't know it's a carbonate, you're going to get a yellowy grey precipitate of silver carbonate. So you're going to think it's sort of an iodide or possibly a bromide. And there's the equation for that. And if you added silver ions to sulfate ions, you're going to get a white precipitate of silver sulfate. But because you didn't know it was a sulfate, you might think it was a chloride. There's the equation for that. So the procedure is you carry out the carbonate test first. If that's negative, you move on to your sulfate test. And if that one's negative, then you move on to the halide test. Calorimetry now. So we use the Cutel's MC delta T equation to calculate the energy that's transferred to the solution in the calorimeter. So M is the mass of the solution whose temperature changes. So in other words, the solution in the cup. Questions often say, assume the density of the solution to be that of water. So in other words, that 1 cm cubed is a gram. Beware, if you've got two solutions, the M is going to be the combined volume in grams. Again, the question might give you this line. Assume the specific heat capacity of the solution is the same as water. So in other words, C equals 4.18. The units of Q come out in joules. So the first thing I would do is convert them straight into kilojoules. And then delta H for an exothermic reaction is minus Q in kilojoules over the moles. Delta H for an endothermic reaction is Q in kilojoules over the moles. And if you've got a limiting reagent, so you've got, often they'll say one of them's in excess. But if they don't, calculate the moles of both. And it's the limiting reagent that you do your divided by moles calculation on. So we'll finish with some limitations. So the obvious one is you're losing heat to the surroundings. You may not be carrying out in standard conditions. The heat capacity of the container is not included in the calculation. And if there's, you know, if it gets quite hot, then the contents of the calorimeter might evaporate. If you are asked to calculate the enthalpy change of neutralization as sort of a practical question, so that's the enthalpy change for reaction between an aqueous acid and alkali to form a mole of water. So in other words, for that reaction there. So the enthalpy change of neutralization for all strong acid alkali combinations is around about the minus 57 kilojoules per mole mark. And that's because they're fully ionized and give the same ionic equation. If you've got a weak acid alkali combination, then it's going to be less exothermic than minus 57. And that's because they are only partially ionized. So some of the energy of the reaction is used to ionize the acid. If you're devising an experiment to determine the enthalpy change of neutralization, it's best to use the same concentration and volume of acid, so you're using the same moles, and go for something like one mole per decimeter cubed or two moles per decimeter cubed, so you get a decent temperature rise that you can actually record. So moving on to the organic topics now, phenol. So it's a weak acid, but it's too weak to react with sodium carbonate, so you don't see any bubbles of CO2. It reacts with bromine without a catalyst, and it gives 246 dry bromophenol. The bromine's decolorized, and you get a white precipitate. It reacts with dilute nitric acid without a catalyst and at RTP. So all of those are leading to the fact that it's more reactive than benzene. And that's due to the fact that it has a higher electron density in the pi system. The lone pair from an oxygen p orbital becomes delocalized into the delocalized ring of pi electrons. So I use this DROP acronym um, to remember to say delocalized ring of pi electrons, basically. And because of this higher electron density, it's able to polarize the reactants. So, for example, bromine, and therefore attract it. Aromatic directing groups now. So the NH2 and the OH groups are both electron donating. 
and they will direct substitutions at positions 2 and 4. These groups increase the electron density of the benzene ring and so they don't need catalysts when they react. So we've just explained why the OH group does that on the previous slide. Lone pair on the p orbital of the oxygen delocalizes into the delocalized ring of pi electrons. NH2 group, well, there's a lone pair on the nitrogen, so that's going to do the same thing. NO2 is the only electron withdrawing group that you need to know off by heart, and that directs to position 3, which is equivalent to 5. So because that's electron withdrawing, it's lowering the electron density of the benzene ring, and so these reactions do need a catalyst. If there's a different directing group other than those three, you will be told whether it's a 2-4 director or a 3 director. Organic functional groups tests now. So again, I've got a big table here. We'll just go through the test and the observation. So alkene add bromine water. Bromine water is decolorized, orange to colorless. Haloalkanes, you add silver nitrate and ethanol and you put in a water bath at 50 degrees C. If it's a chloroalkane, you'd get a white precipitate. Bromo gives cream. Iodo gives yellow. If you've got a carbonyl, you add 2,4-DNP or Brady's reagent. You get an orange precipitate. Aldehyde, add ammoniacal silver nitrate or Tollens reagent and warm. You get a silver mirror. If you've got a primary or a secondary alcohol or an aldehyde, you can test using acidified potassium dichromate 6. Warm in a water bath and you get a colour change orange to green. Carboxylic acid add aqueous sodium carbonate and you'd see effervescence. And finally for a phenol, you would test the pH using a pH meter or indicator and then add some aqueous sodium carbonate. So you should expect a pH less than 7 but no effervescence. Purification of an organic liquid now. So you, once you've made your impure product, you would transfer it into a separating funnel. If you told the density, then less than one gram per cubic centimetre, it's going to be the top layer, because water has a density of one gram per cubic centimetre. If it's greater than one gram per cubic centimetre, it's going to be your bottom layer. If you're not told the density, a quick way to test which layer is which is if you add some distilled water, the layer that gets bigger, is obviously your aqueous layer. You would run out the two layers into separate beakers. You'd then add a drying agent, so examples could be anhydrous calcium chloride or anhydrous magnesium sulfate, and that removes any small traces of water still in your sample. You then filter or decant into a round bottom or pear-shaped flask, and then you'd redistill at the boiling point of the organic liquid. Purification of an organic solid now. So you've made your impure solid and then you'd carry out a recrystallization on it. So you'd cool and filter under reduced pressure using Buckner apparatus. Dissolve the impure solid in a minimum amount of hot solvent. You'd cool it back down, allow the crystals to reform. You'd filter it again under reduced pressure. Wash the purified solid in cold solvent it would dissolve in hot and you don't want that to happen. You dry it and then you could check purity by determining the melting point or you could do TLC, thin layer chromatography. You then compare the melting point to data values or the RF value to the data values. And finally just a reminder that impurities lower melting points and widen melting ranges. Things that are pure have very sharp defined melting points. And finally, you'll be pleased to hear, so well done if you've got this far, chromatography, and we're talking about gas chromatography. So the mobile phase is an inert carrier gas. The stationary phase can be a solid or a liquid. The components in the mixture interact differently with the phases. If it's a solid stationary phase, the interaction is by relative adsorption, not absorption. If it's a liquid stationary phase, the interaction is by relative solubility. Just remember on that one that like dissolves like. 
So if you've got a non-polar liquid stationary phase, your non-polar components in your mixture are going to interact more, and that's obviously going to slow it down um, coming through the column and give it a longer retention time. So retention time is the time from injection of the sample to detection. You would compare the retention times to known data values. And in gas chromatography, the area under the peaks tells you the relative concentrations of the components. It doesn't tell you the exact concentrations. So the percentage component in the mixture is the area of the peak that you're interested in divided by the total area of the peaks. So if you wanted to determine the actual concentration of your sample, you would first do a calibration curve, and that's done by measuring the area under the curve for known concentrations. So you'd run separate chromatograms for known concentrations, measure the area under the curve each time, and then you'd plot area against concentration, then you go back to the area of the peak of your sample and then determine it from your calibration curve. So I think that's it. So the final thing for me is a huge good look.